Thank you for being here, Howard. Always a, a great time to catch up with you, especially now. Uh, kind of our mid-year report, maybe we should call it, on where we are in the markets. And we've heard from some great uh, and insightful people already today here, but most recently um, others who have weighed in on the markets. And I'd like to get sort of your temperature, uh, take the temperature on where we are. Guggenheim's Alan Schwartz said this week, we're in the eighth or ninth inning of the bull market, but there are tremendous storm clouds on the horizon. Jeffrey Gundlach, who I'm figuring you know well, we're getting closer to a recession, he said, looking at the spread between the two-year and the 10-year. Larry Fink noted the narrow breath in the market uh, as being maybe concerning. What do you see? You know, ever since the global crisis, which means 10 years, people have been asking me, what inning are we in? And uh, now I would say we're in the eighth inning. I'd agree with Alan. However, we have to notice that we, it, this isn't baseball, and we don't know how many innings there will be. We could go into extra innings. Exactly. Uh, and and uh, so uh, if it was a nine-inning game, we'd know what that means, but there could be 11, there could be 14. Of course, when you get to this point in the cycle, people start pushing out their horizons, you know? When it's been going on for five years, you, they say, well, I think we could make it three more. When it's going on for 10 years, they think I could make it five more, uh, which is, is counterintuitive. Uh, and, and people are doing that now that shows optimism. It, it's somewhat dangerous. I mean, Jamie Dimon not that long ago said we're in the sixth inning. Warren Buffett seemed to agree with him. What do they see that you don't? Well, first of all, the uh, economic recovery. We're really uh, driving blind now. We're in the tenth year of an economic recovery, and the, the, the record for uh, since the war, war is 10 years. So will we beat the record? Uh, it, it looks like we will, uh, but is there something about 10 years which calls this thing to a close? Well, I could say, well, maybe, you know, you throw history out the window and we've just extended the cycle because of tax reform, regs coming off, and other things that are going on fundamentally around the world that are pretty positive. Exactly, but I, I've just finished a book uh, on cycles called Mastering the Market Cycle, and it's, it's going to the printers. And one of the things it says is that, is that uh, extended bull markets are usually greeted by four words. It's different this time. And, you know, in every extended cycle that I've seen in my 50 years, when you are in the later stages, people started coming up with rationalizations for why it's not going to end. And of course, uh, usually it turns out not to be any different. So we'll see. Uh, it certainly, feel, I heard David a minute ago, and uh, you know, uh, he said he doesn't see a recession this year no or next year. No signs of a year, slowdown, he said. Or next year. I don't see him either. Uh, but you know, when you're, when you're talking about being in the 10th year or 11th year of a recovery and the 10th year of a bull market, how much do you want to push your chips out on the table or do you want to take a few off? That's really the key question. You said in January, quote, and it certainly got a lot of, of fodder, the easy money has been made. Now, the market's changed a little bit yeah. since then. Valuations have come in. Earnings certainly look strong. Do, do you still think? Is, is the market more attractive today than it was in January when you wrote that? It is more attractive because the earnings estimates have gone up a lot. You know, if you went back, let's say, eight months ago before the tax bill was passed, we were talking about a P.E. ratio on the S&P about 23. And uh, now the earnings expectation, uh, the growth projected for this year is so high that now we're talking about a P.E. of about 17. The market went from meaningfully overpriced, not a record, but overpriced, to average price today. That, that, that's a big change. Uh, however, it should be noted that even though earnings projections show growth in the 20s of percent this year, the market is only up a couple of percent this year. Uh, so in other words, a lot of the uh, appreciation of the stock market uh, was front-ended. It had happened by January, I think, and even though earnings are doing like this, stock prices are not. It was pretty confounding how you had incredible earnings growth in the first quarter, 
all of the reasons for the stock market to do well, and it didn't, right. as you point out. We're assuming we're going to have good earnings, and we're in the midst of season now, and, and it seems to be good. It, it, is this time different, or are we being held back by all of these other forces that are out there, geopolitics, trade, worries about rates, et cetera? All those things are important. There are a lot of potential negatives out there. But I, but I think the most important thing for me to say on the subject is that people who do not understand how the markets work or who haven't been around very long tend to think good news, appreciation. It doesn't necessarily work that way because the good news could already have been anticipated, which means that even though the news is good, it's greeted with a yawn. And that seems to be what's going on this year, plus the, the, the progress is uh, deterred by some of these uh, negatives, like uh, sluggishness. You know, eight months ago we were talking about a synchronized uh, global recovery, mm -hmm. and now we can see uh, weakness in, uh, in Europe, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, I think that the, 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 the uh, tariffs and trade war is a, it could be a real issue, whereas eight months ago, nobody uh, had it down as a concern. When people suggest that we could be in a Goldilocks environment, do you scoff at that? Does it feel like that? Growth is expected to remain strong. Inflation is expected to remain tame. Is that Goldilocks? Um, you know, look, the idea that things are, are good and are going to stay that way forever is, it has always gotten people into trouble. Uh, I would love it if it turned out to be true, uh, but you, you, know, you, you reference my statement that the early money's been, the easy money's been made. If you invested in the S&P at the bottom, you've quadrupled your money so far. That kind of appreciation is not in the cards anymore, sure. I don't think. Uh, you know, the the growth that's going to be reported in profits this year is not the trend line growth. It's a bump, a lot of it related to the tax bill. What is going to happen when growth uh, drops back off next year? So uh, I go back to saying, you know, I don't say get in. I don't say get out. I never say this is the time. Sure. Uh, I'm not that smart. But the question is, with, with the, the world configured as it is, with the recovery and the bull market in the, uh, uh, at the age they are, uh, and with the question marks on the horizon, do you want to have as much risk as you had three years ago? The same or more? That's really the question. What cracks the bull market? What's it going to be? I once wrote a memo maybe 15 years ago, and I said, uh, and this will help you date it, I said, well, what could call, cause the bull market to stop? $100 oil, which of course was soon achieved, uh, rising interest rate, dollar weakness, or something else. My money's always on the fourth. You know, uh, one of the greatest oxymorons in the world is we're not expecting any surprises. It's surprises that, mar that, that, that knock the market down, and by definition, surprises are not anticipated. If, if we had to specify today what it'll be, I think you'd have to say rising interest rates, um, uh, producing competition for stocks, and making it harder for companies to service their debt. Uh, but um, I, I think it's folly uh, to think you know, A, what the market's going to do, and B, especially why. If you were sitting here a year ago, and now we're here today, and, and I said, Howard, would you have ever imagined that things would feel and be this good? and the 10-year note yield would be at 285 or wherever it currently sits today without looking at it right now, you would say what? Well, I think that, I think that things have turned out very well in the short run. Uh, things have gone about as well as they could in most areas. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a president who I think fully intends to be a pro-business president and is perceived that way, that's a, that that's gives investors and corporate executives confidence. Um, we have the tax bill, which is very pro-business and stimulative to the economy in the short run. Now, there's a question 
about whether you should stimulate an economy when it's in the ninth year of a recovery. Uh, doctors do not give adrenaline to healthy patients. But, uh, but certainly, it produced a big bang this year. You know, the, 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 the second quarter is estimated to have risen 5%. Uh, at Oak Tree, we are not macro forecasters or macro investors, but you have to look at that and say, that's, that's a heck of a number. Uh, I don't think it's going to uh, extrapolate, uh, but uh, things are going extremely well. And by the way, eight years ago, people were saying, you know, it looks great for Europe. And maybe, as David said, maybe the euro will become a reserve currency. Uh, not, nobody thinks that anymore. And uh, uh, the, the U.S. is pretty much back to being alone at the top of the heap. What then is the message in low rates? Why do we have rates as low as they are? Is it all central bank related, the fact that you still have negative rates in parts of the world? What's the message? Well, I think, I, I, look, I think that a lot of it relates to the central banks. We have negative interest rates. We don't really know what that means. Uh, uh, and uh, the central banks, in running up their balance sheets in, in quantitative easing, have done something that's never been done before. We can't pretend we know how the unwind is going to go. Uh, so, uh, you know, clearly we had artificially low rates. Well, we still do, I think, but we had them for, for nine, 10 years. And uh, uh, the Fed is trying to back out of that now and, and get back to normal. Uh, but, you know, exactly how it goes is unclear. And the, the lowness of long-term rates relative to short-term rates is something people are talking about. Uh, that uh, a, a flat or inverted yield curve has been associated with recessions in the past, maybe again. No, it's not clear, exactly clear why, but it is something that people are worried about. You said that the president and his policies have been good for the economy. If you had to write one of your famous memos and the title was President Trump and the Markets, how would it start? I think that it would start by saying that President Trump's election was, was one of the biggest surprises that anybody living has ever seen, and that how uh, salutary he has been for the economy and for the markets is, is another big surprise. Uh, and, uh, you know, back uh, just before the election, there were only two things that everybody was sure of. Number one, Hillary would win, and number two, if, if, if Trump lost, the market would tank. And uh, among other things, that shows the folly of forecasting. But I, I mean, life has been a big surprise ever since. How would the memo end? Uh, it, well, I think what it would say is that a lot of the things that have been done have clearly been good in the short run. And the long run impact remains to be seen. You worry about the deficit like we've heard on this how stage already not? today? How can you not? When I was a boy, there was a raging debate about whether it was OK for, company, for countries to have debt. Is, is national debt OK? You don't hear that much anymore. And you know, as David said, you're going to add uh, a, 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 a trillion a year to the national debt for the next dozen years. Is there a number that matters? People don't seem concerned anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, people used to be prudish by current standards. And now, in, in, in contrast, it seems that there is no prudence. There's certainly no concern. There's nobody worried. No, you know, and, and if, you, if you get up and pound the, the table for taking away the punch bowl, you're not going to get many votes. So you know. Everybody now has concluded that stimulating the economy, giving away tax breaks, stimulated earnings, uh, this is the way to get votes. But, and, and, and uh, you know, the Republicans historically have been the party of fiscal prudence, and they voted for the tax bill knowing what it would do to the debt and the, and the deficit. I, I thought of, you know, the risks that are, are so obvious as, as we've already laid many of them out, geopolitical and, and domestic. Um, your most recent memo talked about a risk that has been mentioned on this stage 
for years, most notably perhaps from Carl Icahn when he sat here with me a few years back and worried about ETFs mm -hmm. and all of the money uh, passively that has gone into ETFs and what happens when the dam breaks one day. You worried about that as well. Yes. Well, look, ETFs are just another investment technique. And like all the others, they have the feet of clay. When I was a kid, we watched the Lone Ranger. And he, his gun fired silver bullets and he never missed. And everybody in the investment business is always looking for the next silver bullet. And people on the sell side promise it to them. Uh, there is no, thing, no such thing as a silver bullet. There's nothing that delivers high returns without risk. And um, the question is, it's just an investment technique. Do people expect more from it than it can be delivered? And is that going to be a source of disappointment? And will that be a, an important factor in, in, uh, in cracking the market? No investment vehicle, vehicle can, in tough times, be more liquid than the underlying. So for example, we have high yield uh, ETFs, which people assume they can sell any minute. But if they, they know that if they had a portfolio of high yield bonds, it would take them some time to work out. So they think that the ETF is much more liquid than the underlying. Where does that increment in liquidity come from? And the answer is, in tough times, it will be shown to be illusory, in my opinion. Um, uh, now, you look at ETFs, which are, which are uh, let's say, smart beta ETFs. These are rule-based investment technologies. They are no better than their rules. If you have the right rules, it'll work. If you have the wrong rules, it's, it won't work. And there's no way to set the rules with certainty that it'll work. The rules are based on a continuation of the things that have worked working. And they may continue, or David quoted uh, uh, Herb Stein, or they may stop working. And, and, and we'll see. But uh, you know, I keep going back to the fact that there is no silver bullet. The only thing that really can be depended on in the investment world to work is superior judgment, not any technique or algorithm. Do you think there's been a bubble in passive investing? Well, I mean, there's been, certainly been a trend to it. Uh, I would have to, in order to answer your question, I have to do research and find out what the buyers are expecting. I have a feeling they're expecting too much. Even just in the sheer volume right. of money that has flowed into ETFs and other forms of, of passive investing. Merely saying that I'd rather own stocks in an ETF than directly or in a mutual fund is not necessarily wrong. As long as you understand that it, if the market has a hiccup, your ETF will get hurt and you may not be able to get out so close to the last price as you thought. Uh, now, the, the one thing that, uh, that sh probably should be highlighted about ETFs is that a, a conspicuous number of ETFs are concentrated in the same stocks because the, most, many of them use momentum as a factor. Momentum favors a, 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 you know, a, a relatively short list of stocks. And uh, you know, the, can, the, the movement of money into ETFs which feature those particular stocks certainly has contributed to the increase in the prices of those stocks relative to other stocks. You're, you're somewhat alluding, and maybe directly, to FANG stocks. Yes. Right? You look right. at the right. appreciation right. of those stocks and say that ETFs have maybe artificially propped up some of these names. Right. They're great companies, but, they, but the ETFs probably have accentuated the flow of capital into those stocks. And when, when things go cold, and, and the person who expected instantaneous uh, liquidity can't get it, uh, he's going to turn around. He's going to look for somebody to sell that ETF to. Who's going to buy it? You write, like the tech stocks in 2000, this seeming uh, perpetual motion mas machine is unlikely to work forever. Nothing works forever. And, and things that are the most hyped, and usually the things that are the most loved, produce the most disappointment and the most pain. Is that what maybe causes the unwind? All of uh, you know, this, we, we've talked whether it's looking at ETF flow, uh, what is it? 
The FANG stocks alone have cost 70% of the, have amounted for 70% of the gains in the S&P. Right. You add in a few other tech stocks and you're talking about 90 plus percent? Well, when you, the when you, danger area, the red, the red, the red lights red, are flashing well, there? Well, but, but you see, when, thi when something has worked for uh, six, eight, 10 years, people do tend to consider it a, a perpetual motion machine and think it'll go on forever. Uh, and people say, well, is that what's gonna crack it? And the answer is, well, what's gonna change their mind? As long as they think that, that Amazon and ETFs are perpetual motion machines and they keep putting in capital, they won't crack. So clearly wh when they crack, that could be something that hurts the market a lot. What's gonna make them crack? So how then, given everything we've discussed, are you trying to deliver alpha? Where are you finding it? Where are the best opportunities that Oak Tree sees it? Well, at Oak Tree, we have had a motto for some time now, move forward but with caution. We are investing every day. We're trying to be fully invested, but we are emphasizing cautious. caution. We're a cautious firm, so that means more caution than usual, even. And um, so I think that a, a, a great, the greatest achievement of Alpha is to get, let's say, returns that are almost as good as the risk taker with a lot less risk. And we're trying to do that. We've been very good at it in the past, and I think we, we will be able to do it in the future. That is our emphasis today. In a, in a hot market, which is characterized by risk tolerance and optimism and a lack of skepticism and a lack of cynicism, it is a mistake to try to outperform the best performers. Because to do that, you have to take a hot, hell of a lot of risk. And at Oak Tree, that is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to have almost as good a return as the hottest performers, but with a lot less risk. And I think that's a signal accomplishment, and, and, uh, and, and that's where we are today. Having said that, Scott, there are specific markets that we like. Uh, and, and where Oak Tree is active, and uh, those would include emerging market uh, equities, private lending, real estate lending, um, and uh, infrastructure, things along those lines. For the most part, one of my competitors, I forget exactly which one, once said that everything with the QSIP is overpriced. Public securities are basically priced higher than private securities today. And, and, and I think that a lot of the best opportunities are on the private side, which Oak Tree emphasizes. It is interesting, though, that you like emerging market equities. Yep. And the question that we asked the audience before we walked out on the stage, the majority uh, liked emerging market equities as well. Yes, that's right. Versus the US. Well, look, they've been hit. They, they, they have been significantly hit. And uh, the pendulum of opinion swings radically with regard, uh, with regard to the emerging markets. And in the last uh, you know, months or year or so, it has been on the negative side. How many things can you find today that are down? How many things can you find that are unloved? Uh, these are the things that Oak Tree likes to emphasis, emphasize, and, and, and this category is one of them. Are you, how are you positioned as it relates to high yield? Well, high yield, we're a, we're a so-called long-only investor. We don't go short. Uh, the, the, this summer celebrates my 40th year in, in high yield bonds. Uh, and we so are- no better person to ask that question. We are that. primarily single B investors. We think that triple C introduces too much risk and double B gives up too much yield. So we like the single B. And, and uh, rather than uh, you know, we have a motto at Oak Tree, if we avoid the losers, the winners take care of themselves. And that emerged primarily from my experience with high yield bonds. So we try to buy a portfolio that yields almost as much as a, as a, a non-selected portfolio, but with a lot less credit risk. At the end of the year, is the stock market going to be higher than it is today or lower? Even. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Howard Marks answer. Uh, give me your riff. We have, let's just say we have 30 seconds left before we go. What's your riff on, on Bitcoin? We've heard some conversation today. You're going to hear more of it uh, later on, on some panels as well. Well, you know, I wrote some memos and touched on Bitcoin a year ago, 
And uh, as my dad used to tell a joke, Bitcoin is not an investing sardine, it's a trading sardine. And uh, the people who are buying Bitcoin are buying it because they think that somebody else will buy it from them at a higher price. Not because they can specify its intrinsic benefits, not because they can judge uh, the, the intrinsic value, but only because they think it's going up. And, and, and why will somebody else pay them more than they paid for it? Well, because they think somebody will pay them more than they paid for it. This is what we called, when I was a kid, the greater fool theory. And I think that this, this, this is a trading, a speculative medium, and I think that that's what Bitcoin is. And it, you know, last year showed that it can have great years, but in the long run, I think it'll be shown not to have any substance. Can't thank you enough for your time. Thank it's you. great having you here at Delivering Alpha. Howard Marks.